Father, here we are again at this precious and most important time of privilege in our life. Each Lord's Day morning as we stand here, we are overwhelmed once more with the precious privilege which we have. It's all of grace. It has been grace down through the years and this grace this morning that will continue to be grace until Jesus comes and takes us to be with himself. And Father, never have we sensed the reality of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ like, like we've sensed it this week. The life of that body who is Jesus himself flowing in each one of the members making the body one no, Father, we thank you for the knowledge that the Holy Spirit in us puts us in relationship and in contact with and in real fellowship with all those who have been made a part of the body of Christ by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we offer ourselves to you to give this message, we pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to the needs of the body each member of that body, no matter how weak they may see themselves in their eyes or how strong they may be, we know that you will discern their needs and you will meet those needs in this thy word this morning. Pray for the members of the body that are present here this morning. Make me aware as the Holy Spirit speaks through me of their presence and of their needs more important, Father, to me is that you might discern my need and that you might need it abundantly in Jesus as you've done so wonderfully and so many, many times. Pray for each person here. We're all in unique circumstances and each of us live in a different world. No one can really know the world we live in and walk in but we ourselves, nor can we know their world. And Father, this is what's so precious about having Jesus. He walks in our world with us wherever we are, knows what we feel, knows what we think, knows what we need. Father, thank you for this precious, precious Savior, this friend, this husband, this lover, this companion. We thank you for this high priest, who is now in the temple in heaven and also in this temple upon the earth, this temple, this body. So now speak to our hearts as a father would to his children, as a kind shepherd would to his sheep. And may we hear from Jesus as a groom would speak to his bride. And we'll remember that all the praise and all the glory all the honor, the worship, the adoration belongs unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you this morning on the subject of the mystery of prayer. <coughs> Prayer has always been a mystery to me, and when I first became a Christian many years ago, someone asked me the question, and I've heard it asked a hundred times since, how much do you pray? It seemed like every time I turned around, someone in the religious world wanted to know how much I prayed. And no matter how much I prayed, I didn't seem to pray enough. And no matter how fervently I seemed to pray, I didn't seem to get the results I should get. And prayer became not only a great mystery, it became a great matter of confusion, frustration, and disappointment to me. Just before we go into the subject of the mystery of prayer, I might give as a word of apologetics the reason why I use the word mystery so much. A mystery is something that's revealed to the heart by the Holy Spirit, something that's been previously hidden something we haven't been able to discern before, something we haven't been able to lay hold of before, and then suddenly the Holy Spirit reveals it to our hearts. He never teaches it to our minds, but he reveals it to our hearts. 
And when we see it, it is no longer a mystery. All of the truth of God is a mystery. That's the reason there are so many interpretations of the Bible. Once the believer has the mystery of these various things revealed to his heart, they are no longer a mystery to him, but they remain a deep mystery to those who are outside the household of faith. And I don't know any greater mystery, perhaps, in the whole religious world than the mystery of prayer. And I don't know of anything that is so popular in the religious community than the subject of prayer. No Bible conference would be complete without a series of messages on prayer. No evangelistic effort would be complete without some stirring message on prayer, challenging God's people to pray more and to pray longer and to pray more fervently, to get more results and outlining the needs of prayer. Yet I don't know of any subject where more darkness is apparent than in the realm of the subject of prayer. So much darkness pawned off for light. So much understanding passed on to us, and yet it becomes misunderstanding. Prayer, as it is taught in the religious world, is a confusing subject. It's a disappointing experience. It's a very nebulous doctrine. Nobody seems to be able to give any consistent teaching on it. And in the practice of prayer... I don't know of anything that Christians do that is more filled and fraught with works where self-righteousness is more evident, where the pride and the glory of man prevail so much, where the depraved nature of man comes through so clearly than in the subject of prayer and in the practice of prayer. Here is where we really see what's in our hearts. Here is where all of our obsession to use God for us instead of God using us for him comes through. We never seem to pray about anything unless it's beyond our help. We never seem to take anything to God in prayer unless we can't handle it. He gets the burdens. He gets the problems. He gets the questions. But you say he wants them. He says, put them upon him. Yes, and he wants other things too. He wants the joy and the sunshine and the happiness and the blessing of your life as well. He wants your fellowship and he wants your love. He wants your submission. He wants your communion. He wants your worship, your adoration. He wants your praise and he wants your thanksgiving. The majority of our prayers are filled with complaining and murmuring, begging and insisting in a vain effort to use God as our servant instead of being available to him that he might do in us and for us what he wants to do. Now I'm going to attack this idol of prayer this morning. And there isn't anything that makes men more angry than to take away their idols. And when you take away the religious world's images and idols their own works, their own self-righteousness, you will make yourself some enemies. And I've made many, many enemies, and I do each time I preach. There's one consolation. That if this message could be used to take away a yoke and a burden and a heartbreak from one child of God, then he will love me, and he will love God's Word And he will love the Holy Spirit for setting him free and giving him the liberty that his heart knows must be there in Christ. Now the reason why the subject of prayer is a mystery is because of another mystery called the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity, in short, without going into any lengthy description of it, is professing Christianity who does not possess the Lord Jesus Christ. It may be orthodox Christianity, that is, it may be sound and fundamental, it may be scriptural and doctrinally correct, but it's without life. The mystery of iniquity is professing Christianity without the reality of Jesus Christ himself. It's personified in the church business. It's seen in all religious organizations. It's drawing nigh to God with the lips when the heart is far from him. 
It is a form of godliness, but without the power of that godliness who is Christ himself. Salvation, you see, and religion are two different things, and religion is religion whether it calls itself Christianity or Buddhism. And the greatest religion in America is Christianity public, professing, organized Christianity. Yet when we read the New Testament, we read of a real living experience with Jesus Christ. And because of the mystery of iniquity, and as it abounds today, because of the power and influence of its teaching upon our minds, not upon our hearts, because it is Satan's instrument to blind men's hearts, and minds, then we have so much rubbish on the wall that we have to remove some of it before we can present the truth. Mystery of iniquity, organized religion, professing Christianity, call it what you will, it has one thing in common with all other religions in the world. It always gives its followers something to do. And by giving them something to do, they have a way to measure their spirituality. They have a way to be assured in their hearts that they're in the right standing with God. Salvation never preaches anything to do. It preaches something that's been done. It never preaches who I am and what I am, but it preaches who he is and what he is now for me. It doesn't concern itself with earth. It concerns itself with heaven. And it doesn't fill our minds with thoughts of dying and leaving earth and getting to heaven, but it brings heaven into our hearts where we are and makes earth worthwhile. Salvation is an entirely different thing from religion. Religion doesn't have a person. Salvation has a person. His name is Jesus. He's a real person. He lives in and he lives through each one of those who belong to him. And there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And in that day when Jesus comes and men are gathered before him, the scripture is very plain from the mouth of the Lord himself. Not a few, but many shall stand before him in that day and call him Lord. And say, did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not prophesy in thy name? And did we not do many wonderful things? works in thy name. And he will say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew ye. You may know about his name, and you may know about his doctrine, you may read his book and learn his theology, but unless you know him, you will die, perish, and go to hell for all eternity. The main difference between religion and salvation is simply that religion always gives something to do to those who follow it. And one of the greatest doing things taught in religion is prayer. Prayer is something we must do, we are told. We're warned about our duties of prayer, our responsibilities in prayer. We're always exhorted along these lines and what God expects out of me in prayer and the results that I should look for and the, the secret ways to get it done. Every good Bible conference has its prayer specialist who will give you nine points for victorious prayer or ten points for a successful prayer life or how to pray and get results or the power of prayer or the beauty of prevailing prayer and all of these powerful, powerful messages that lay upon me the duty and the burden and the yoke of prayer are sprinkled with the personal experiences of the man himself, how he prayed and got his victory. And if you don't have that victory, you're not praying. How he prayed and got his results, how he held on to God, and because of his faith, God heard him and God answered. Pretty soon it becomes a very, not only confusing thing to the believer, it becomes a heartbreaking thing to the believer, because I never listened to a message on prayer where I ever felt like my prayer life was adequate. Always came away feeling like I was 4F in God's praying army, and I determined that I was going to pray longer and pray harder and pray more fervently. And when I tried, I discovered what my heart couldn't deny, 
And it was just as much of a duty, a chore, a burdensome thing as it had always been before. Not just Christianity emphasizes praying. All religions emphasize praying. If you will study the Koran, I think one of its most marked characteristics is the wearisome reiteration of the duty of prayer. If you will study Buddhism, you will find that one of its main duties is prayer. If you visit any Asian country, you will see the devotees to their particular religion spinning their prayer wheels. It becomes so complicated that they don't have time to say the words, so they put the prayers in a wheel. And every time they turn the wheel, they have said a prayer. And so hour after hour and day after day, they spin their prayer wheels, spin their prayer wheels. Like the prayers of the prophets of Baal, they are without effect. And you don't have to visit the eastern countries. Just look around among Orthodox Judaism today, and it's just the same as it was 2,000 years ago. You find those who are devoted to the religion of Judaism praying three times daily. The hour of the morning sacrifice at the ninth hour of the day and at the hour of the evening sacrifice. And all of their prayers are formal, long, and pretentious. And always with the same futility. Catholicism is noted for its emphasis on prayer. Its devotees have counted their beads, each bead representing a prayer to God. Hail Mary and our Father. Prayer is the order of the day, it's the duty, it's the responsibility, it's the burden, it's the work that the Christian must carry on. Somehow I was always left with the impression that God couldn't run his world and he couldn't accomplish a thing without my prayers. And I was terrified at the very prospect of that because who am I to give counsel to God? Who am I to have the wisdom that God needs? And who am I brilliant enough to frame in my mind the requests that ought to be made before God? Prayer in the religious world in all of these religions is one thing, but all my brethren, prayer in the Protestant world is the worst yet. Look around in professing Christianity and you'll find that everyone is striving to find the secret formula for prayer. I'm reminded of a letter I got in the book room. The dear lady wrote in in all sincerity and she said, I'm closing three dollars. Please send me a prayer that will get results. Another dear saint wrote in and said, uh, Dear sirs, each time I pray, I fail. I've reworded my prayers over and over, but I get no more results. Tell me how to word my prayer so God will hear me. And on practically every gospel track anyone ever handed you, someone had already worded the prayer assuring you that if you would say this very prayer, God would hear you and God would answer you. And so from that kind of teaching, I always believed that prayer must be a secret formula kind of thing, an equation. If you don't get the numbers just right and the words in the right place, God can't hear you and God won't hear you. What awful, terrible blasphemy. God is my Father. Will he not hear his child no matter how bungling his speech may be? Yes. Then I was always <laughs> getting prayer letters. <laughs> you ever get a prayer letter? Yeah. You know what prayer letters are? They're not prayers to God. They're prayers to man. <laughs> Please pray for me, dear brother, that the Lord will provide me with a tape recorder or a new Jeep or uh, a slide projector or a little more missionary support every month, or that he will give me this or give me that or do this for me or do that for me. Let's all get together and beseech God that he will provide these things for me and do these things for me. But it ends up praying to man because any man that ever wrote a prayer letter knows down in his heart that if he gets his message across on that paper, somebody will be convicted when they read it and answer his prayers for him. You agree to that? Be honest. Of course. 
their pet theory is tell God and then tell his people, listen, you truly tell God and God will tell his people. You don't need to bother about that. And I promise you this, if God can't tell his people, you'll sure not get the job done with a mimeograph machine. Prayer letters. Oh, I've, I've read hundreds of them in my time. And then our prayer lists. Please add me to your prayer list. Early in my Christian experience, I was given a prayer list. Well, correct that. It was a prayer calendar. On Monday, I prayed for the missionaries in Africa. On Tuesday, I prayed for the missionaries in South America. On Wednesday, I prayed for them in Alaska. And on Thursday, I prayed for them in the islands of the sea. (laughs) And on Friday, I don't know, I went around the world every week. And that was just my missionary responsibility. Also on Monday, I prayed for the pastor, and on Tuesday for the deacons, and Wednesday for the elders, and Thursday for the missionary committee, and and Friday for the choir director, and Saturday for the program of the church, and Sunday for the bus ministry. (laughs) And then in between, there was the building fund, and there was the Sunday school, and there was the door-to-door visitation, and there was a million other things that I had to pray for, and oh, it was such a burden. My, oh, my. And then on that prayer calendar, there were also requests. And Susie had arthritis. Monday afternoon, we'll pray for her. Uncle Henry had the gout. We had to cover him on Tuesday. Then there were the hospitals and the mental institutions and the prisons and the places of confinement. There was the sick and the needy and the poor and the lost. Backslidden Christians. Church programs that weren't getting off the ground. Discord and division among the saints. Problems. If you ever tried to pray under that kind of a program, you know what kind of burden, what kind of a heartbreak it really is. Because all you ended up doing was getting on your knees and reading the paper to God. It'd been cheaper to mail him one. It'd been easier to send him one. Let him read it for himself. But all over this country and all over the world today, there are millions of Christians doing just exactly that. And I point out at this point in the message that there's a world difference between praying and saying your prayers. And then the prayer meetings. What were the prayer meetings all about? Well, the prayer meetings were all about our requests. Does anyone have a request? Yes. And it was always for somebody's illness. It was always for somebody who lost a job. Always for something in the church program that was hung up. Always for some material or physical need. Always an endeavor joining our prayers together to use God in our behalf and to use Him in our favor and to somehow get Him to be interested in working with us to do in our lives what we had already decided He ought to do and what needed to be done. So that's the kind of prayer experience I had. It was a continual guide by which I measured my spirituality and by which others measured my spirituality. Hence the question, how much do you pray? And I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a meeting and had the minister get up and say to his congregation, how many of you prayed two hours today? How many of you prayed an hour? How many of you prayed a half hour? Would you believe 15 minutes? How many of you prayed five minutes? How many of you prayed at all? And then the lecture came. And the lecture came and it went like this. If you didn't pray as much as I prayed today, you're backslidden. If you're not spending an hour in prayer every morning, an hour in prayer every evening, I wonder if you're even a Christian. Why, your spirituality is measured by the length of time you spend on your knees. No wonder things are not right in your life. Don't you know that prayer changes things? And things is what we want to change in our lives. Therefore, let us pray more and more things will be changed. And the only things that we ever seem to pray about are the things that we can't change ourselves. If I could change something that I want to change, I'd just go get the job done and not bother God about it. But the things we pray about are the things that we're frustrated in. And if you'll analyze those very carefully in your own heart, you'll find that they're always heart problems. 
you're frustrated because I won't do what you want me to do or be what you want me to be, so you're going to pray for me that God will change me and therefore change things in your life. Oh, you can't get the job done. It won't work that way. And I don't want to uh, put any sincere person down, but I want to share with you some of the, the darkness that I've been in. You just heard a little bit about it. Most of the public prayers I ever listened to were orations. They were monologues, but never dialogues. They were public speeches where we often took advantage of God to preach to somebody over his shoulder. And the ridiculous idea of quoting scripture to God to remind him what he had written in his Bible and presenting to him our lengthy explanations of how we think he ought to do what we want done, and presenting to him our clever plans and strategies for doing in our lives what we're certain needs to be done, the silliness of all of that ought to be apparent to any thinking man and woman on the face of the earth. I used to work for the chain store, and they made me department manager. And in the chain store, as you move up, the bigger your title, the more work and less pay you get. That's the name of the game. So when they made me department manager, I got more responsibility and longer hours and made less money. But uh, when I was department manager, I got the important task of requisitioning merchandise from our pool stock and writing purchase orders from independent uh, sources to bring in merchandise into the store, but I noticed one thing in all my important office was that every purchase order I wrote and every requisition I signed had to go down to manager's desk. And it told me a little thing that I didn't like to face, and that is that I wasn't really the department head after all, that I was just doing the paperwork for the man who did make the decisions. And so I'd fill out those order blanks just like I thought they ought to be filled out, and I'd send them down, and I'd patiently wait for him to sign his okay on them, and it reminds me of how Christians pray. They sit down and fill out the purchase orders and make out their requisitions, and they send them up to God's desk, and then they bother him until he says, all right, you've bothered me long enough, I'm just going to sign a thing and get it in the mail. And if he dares change a single quantity on our requisition, if he dares suggest a little change, we feel hurt and put down. Hey, brethren, you've been had in the religious world. Somebody put you on. You're not a department manager in the household of faith. You're not even a janitor. God holds all the positions in this business. He's even the janitor. He comes behind me every day of my life, sweeping up the pieces. Goodness and mercy shall follow thee all the days of thy life. Thou shalt dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's God who is the subject of real Christianity, and Jesus Christ who is the life of it. And until we understand that all that pertains to the Christian life has to do with the person, we're never, never, never going to plunge into the understanding of the mysteries of God's Word. One last thing I want to mention in the religious world, and then we're going to the Word to study the subject of prayer. You never understand why praying was more important than reading the Bible. Oh, we were always exhorted to read the Bible, but we were exhorted to pray more. And I never could understand how what I had to say to God was always more important than what God had to say to me. And I always wondered why it was more necessary that God listen to me than it was that I listened to Him. But if there was a choice between praying and reading, praying came first, because praying will accomplish something. Praying will get the job done. And it seemed to be the inference there that it didn't really matter what God said. What really mattered was what I said and whether I could talk God into doing what I thought and what I felt and what I wanted. So, summing up my little description of prayer life in the religious world, you come back to the same central theme of religion, that man is God 
and God is the servant of the man who invented that religion. And it's found in the first chapter of the book of Romans. It's a doctrine of the New Testament about the human heart. They worship and serve the creature more than the creation. And they corrupt and pervert and twist and warp the word of God until they turn the truth into a lie. And how they make with their own hands an image like unto four-footed beasts and creeping things and birds that fly and bow down and worship the thing they created and thereby make themselves the creator. You see it in the story of the golden calf. Now I'd like to read... A few verses of Scripture. Listen carefully while I read. You don't need to follow me because it will confuse you, but I'll tell you where the quotes are if you want to jot them down or whatever. I want to read a few verses of Scripture on what the New Testament has to say about prayer, and then we're going to examine our prayer life. First verse I'm going to read is in Romans 1 9. Paul speaking here, and he says, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Now listen carefully, brethren. Paul is calling on God and the Holy Spirit and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bear witness to the truthfulness of about this statement he's about to say here. Listen, God is my witness. God knows that I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, and here's what I want him to witness to. God is my witness. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, how many of you could call God for witness that without ceasing, you have made mention of me always in your prayers? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace which is given you by Jesus Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Look at chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Look at Philippians 1, 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. Look at chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful, that is, be worried, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Look at Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Look at the third verse of the same chapter. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. In chapter 3, verse 17, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In First Thessalonians, uh, the first chapter, verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. In the third chapter, the ninth verse, For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Look in the fifth chapter, verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And quench not the Spirit. 
in Second Timothy, the first chapter, the third verse. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. That's a humbling little string of scriptures, isn't it? Because there are several things quite apparent to anyone who reads those verses of scriptures. Number one, if prayer is what I have been taught it is, I have never been praying any. Prayer, I read in these passages of scripture, have nothing to do with words as such, though they may put themselves into words. It has nothing to do with the length of our prayers, time-wise. It has nothing to do with the form of our prayers. It has nothing to do with the physical exercise of prayer as we've been taught to pray in religion. Who do you know has prayed without ceasing? Who do you know who can say, I have prayed day and night? and without ceasing, and always, and never failing, who can say that my prayer life is as Paul's prayer life was? And if you will note in all of these references to Paul's prayer life, you will not find a single material or physical subject mentioned. You will find that his entire prayer life involved the spiritual the concern and care and development of the little man inside, the inner man, the spiritual man, the man that was in Christ Jesus. And you'll see that everything Paul prayed for was the will of God concerning all saints. And that Paul's prayers for the Ephesians and the Colossians and the Philippians and the Thessalonians and the Romans and for whomever he prayed in those first days of Christianity are still in effect and they're still being prayed by the same person for you and I today. The same prayers are being answered. Now what we have here is a failure to communicate. Now let me explain that the major problem with understanding prayer is a dispensational problem. Now if you don't know what dispensations are or a dispensational problem, let me explain just a little bit. A dispensation is a word which simply refers to a specific period of time. A period of time during which certain things are in effect. A man told me once, I don't believe in dispensationalism. I don't think there are any different dispensations in the Bible. Well, if you believe in the Old and New Testament, you're a dispensationalist. If you believe that there was one way that God did things at one period of time, and now perhaps a different way, then you're a dispensationalist. You say there's always been one dispensation, always one way to be saved. Well, you're not offering any lambs on altars now. No priest walks into an earthly tent swinging a censer of incense. No wave sheaf offerings are made before the Lord. No scapegoats are led away in the wilderness. No burnt offerings are made at some public offer any longer among true Christians. And if that be a fact, then God apparently has changed his way of doing things sometime down through the years of time. There are certain things in the Bible, for instance, that are no longer in force. God has never changed his principles. God has never changed his morals. God has never changed his ethics. God has never changed the basic characteristics that mark him as God. The way he has revealed himself to man has certainly changed. And the things that he reveals to man has certainly changed. And the truth that he has given has certainly grown more progressively larger and larger and larger. So that what we know today causes us to look backward on what we learned yesterday and realize that there is a progressive revelation of God to our hearts and so it is true. Now, when I say we have a dispensational problem with prayer, I mean just this. You notice that there's a lot said in the Old Testament about prayer and there are many famous prayers 
held up before us in the Old Testament. Daniel was one. Remember how he prayed facing Jerusalem every day? And you know what it cost him to pray too, don't you? We read about Moses being a great man of prayer. Abraham was a man of prayer. And believe it or not, and like it or not, Lot was a great man of prayer. Elijah was a great man of prayer. And James cites him in the New Testament. But James, you will have to remember, was teaching kingdom truth and kingdom law in his little epistle when he held Elijah up before us as an example of a righteous man who prayed fervently and got results. David was a man of prayer. Solomon was a man of prayer. Hannah was a woman of prayer. And Samuel, her son, was the result of her prayer life. Eli was a man of prayer. Samson was a man of prayer. In fact, the very temple of God in Jerusalem was called by Jesus the house of prayer. It was the acceptable place of prayer. But, dear people, if you read the Bible correctly, you will find that there came a vast change in God's economy through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, without going into any lengthy detail, if you want to know more about it, hear the message on rightly dividing the word and you'll understand what I'm talking about. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, remember, he did not come and present himself to the Gentiles. He presented himself to the nation of Israel. And he came in fulfillment of all the Jewish prophecies and promises. Came and declared himself to be God's anointed, the Messiah, the Christ. The one God said in the Old Testament prophecies would come, and he came to sit on David's throne, and he was to fulfill all of the anointed offices of the Old Testament economy, prophet, priest, and king in one man, only likened in the person of Melchizedek. Jesus came and he refused his disciples the right to preach to the Samaritans or the Gentiles. He sent them only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He had no message for the Gentiles when he walked upon this earth. He had no good news for Gentiles when he walked upon this earth. The 33 years that the Lord Jesus Christ lived, his message was shut up to the house of David. His voice was directed to the elect among Israel. And he came proclaiming one thing. It was voiced in the mouth of his herald, John the Baptist. Repent, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. The kingdom is at hand. Why was it at hand? Why the king was very present with them. And he was about to take the reins of their government and the governments of this earth upon his own shoulders and to rule the world as God had promised he would someday do by a personal visitation of himself to earth. Now, if you read the four Gospels, you'll see that that's what you're reading about. You're reading about a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish Christ. The anointed one of God who came to fulfill the promises made to his father's house years ago when David was upon the throne. These promises were first made through the testament of the law, confirmed in the house of David, passed on down through the years until the time when Jesus, at a strategic moment in history, entered the human race. And he came not preaching grace. He came not preaching universal redemption. He came not preaching a blood sacrifice. He came not teaching a substitutionary atonement. He came proclaiming a kingdom. And he came announcing himself as king. And he came to give the rules and regulations of his kingdom and the laws by which the subjects of his kingdom would be governed. Fact? Fact. That's what the Sermon on the Mount was. It was the king's inaugural address, intended to take effect the moment that he seated himself on the throne in Jerusalem. That's what the Lord's Prayer, as we call it affectionately, is all about. It was how people in the kingdom were to pray. It's what the Beatitudes were all about. It was the ordinary rules of life that would govern the subjects of his kingdom. It's what the golden rule was meant to teach. That when the king is present upon his throne, we can do unto others whatsoever we would have them do unto us. 
and it will work out fine and we can go the extra mile and we can give our brother our cloak if we have an extra one we can turn our cheek and we can do all of those things that are recorded in the gospel messages of Jesus to the Jew but oh my dear friends I want you to know this that the kingdom promises cannot work and the kingdom laws are not in effect and the kingdom rules and regulations are ineffective until kingdom conditions are present. Three conditions mark the kingdom. The literal kingdom that God promised to set up upon this earth. First of all, it would be marked by the very real presence of the king himself. Lord of lords and king of kings, he is called. And God's anointed king, the Lord Jesus Christ, would take the scepter of righteousness in his own hand and they would crown him with many crowns, and there upon the throne of his father David, he would rule forever and ever, and the end of his kingdom would never come. Not only would the king be personally present, but the world, the earth itself, would be released from the bondage of its curse and sin. The deserts would blossom like a rose garden. The hills would flow with milk and honey. The curse would be taken from the animal kingdom and the lion would lay down with the lamb. A child could play on a cockatrice den. No harm would come to it. They never need swords and spears anymore because no man would ever learn war and they'd beat them into agricultural instruments to plow the fertile fields with and the briars and thorns will not grow. And the earth will be filled with the goodness of the Lord. And it will be returned to its primeval beauty. And it will become one large garden of Eden. One look at your tomato patch tells you this ain't the time. Second condition that marks the kingdom's presence. Not only the king. Not only the curse lifted from the universe itself, from the earth and from the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom and whatever, it also tells us that the devil, there's going to be some change in his program. God's going to bind him with a chain and put him in the bottomless pit. He will not roam the earth anymore going to and fro like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He will no longer have access into the very presence of God, for he will be cast out of heaven. No longer will he be the prince of the power of the air. No longer will he rule over principalities and powers in the kingdom of darkness. No longer will he bring his delusion to the minds of men. No longer will he deceive man with his words. His activity will be ended for a period of 1,000 blessed years. But... All you have to do is to listen to your local politicians and find out that the lie has not been removed from our society yet. And uh, all you have to do is just listen to a few of your Christian brethren and find that out. The devil is still accusing the brethren. He's still having access to heaven. He's still roaming the earth like a roaring lion seeking, seeking whom he may devour. He's still tearing up Job's life for him. And he's still doing all of the things that God permits him to do and allows him to do. And he's still deceiving men in the mystery of iniquity. And it will not end until the man of sin, his Messiah, comes and seats himself in Jerusalem. Then God will send his son, throw him off the throne, put Satan in the bottomless pit and put his own blessed son on the throne in Jerusalem. And he'll set this world right. But it hasn't come yet. And not only that, when the kingdom is in force, The depraved nature of man will be under the direct control of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to reign with a rod of iron. And he's going to lay down the rules. And he's going to give the laws. And men will be made to come to Jerusalem every year to worship him. And they will walk by those rules and live by those regulations and obey those laws and make those sacrifices or the rod of iron will come down on him. The promise of the Old Testament prophet is that when the kingdom is in force, a man may live for the thousand years if he doesn't break the law, but he'll be surely cut off if he does. Oh no, brethren, 
the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels in the New Testament have nothing to do with the age of grace. They have to do with the age of the kingdom. And that's not going to happen until, first of all, the king comes back. And when the king comes back, everything he said in Matthew will be in effect. And every promise he gave in Mark and Luke will be in, 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 in effect with power. And you can take every promise that he gave to the Jew and apply it to the nations of the world. But you have to wait till the king comes back to get that done. And if you don't, you'll be bending scripture out of shape. And worse than that, you'll be bending your own heart out of shape. Now this is the message the churches teach and preach. is the kingdom gospel, the kingdom commission, the kingdom signs, the kingdom promises, and the kingdom law. It isn't any wonder that most of God's people who have to sit under such a ministry as that are miserable. It isn't any wonder they're broken hearted. It isn't any wonder they can't find the secret to a victorious life. It isn't any wonder that they can't learn what it means to have some kind of peace and joy, yet the gospel promises it. Saved by grace and immediately grabbed by false teachers and false shepherds and placed under the very law that was nailed to the cross in the body of their Savior. And there isn't any place in the Christian world where it shows up like it shows up in the subject of prayer. Listen, we seem to believe in prayer as long as it works. And then when it doesn't work, we're discouraged and frustrated and disappointed and a little mad at God. Christianity's teaching on prayer is about as childish as a little boy who comes in with a four-leaf clover in his hand and says, Look, I found a dollar laying out on the sidewalk. And it's all because I found a four-leaf clover. The next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and no dollar appears, and he throws his four-leaf clover away and says, Well, it's not work anymore. It'll work for a while. And you go to most prayer meetings and you hear the Christians testify, Praise God, I got victory. But let me tell you something, brother. That takes place in about a 45-minute time span on Wednesday night. You follow them around the rest of the seven days and hear what kind of victory they got. What they report in prayer meeting on Wednesday night is the one little time or the one little experience during the week that they can lay hands on to somehow prove to them that the power of prayer must still be there. And if they prayed harder this week and more fervently this week and got things right in their own life, God would do a little more for them. Now listen to me as I tell you about the prayer promises in the kingdom law. Sure they're there. Things like, Whatsoever ye ask in my name, Phrases like all things. Phrases like anything. Phrases like, why, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to a mountain, Be thou removed into the sea. And it would be removed. How many of you ever moved a mountain into the sea? I've had some mountains to move, but I, I, I moved one mountain that cost me $1,700 because I had to get a bulldozer. <laughs> I wish I'd have had just the faith of a grain of mustard seed. I'd already had enough faith to save my soul for all eternity. I'd had enough faith to bring the Son of God right into my heart to live, but I didn't have enough faith to move a little pile of dirt. Yet there's a promise of God. Who do you know who ever moved a mountain into the sea? Who do you know who ever commanded a mountain in the name of Jesus Christ to be removed from that scene and drop right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? No man ever did it, and no man ever will, yet that promise is there. We just very cleverly ignore it and say, well, that's certainly true if I had enough faith. No, Jesus didn't say nothing about a big quantity of faith. He said if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed. You ever see a grain of mustard seed? Believe a sesame seed? I'd hate to admit that I was a Christian and didn't have that much faith. Faith is the gift of God. He sure didn't give you much. I'd go back and get a second helping if I were you and then go around here moving mountains. In fact, if I had that kind of faith and I could make that promise work, I'd go in business tomorrow morning. I'd call it the Roush Mountain Moving Business. <laughs> Bring your mountain stuff, we'll move them for you. 
I come to my office and say, we've got a big mountain over here. We're going to do a little housing development, and we've got a couple of mountains in the way. Do you suppose you can do anything about it? Certainly. <laughs> what sea do you want them in? How about the high river? Uh, you go back tonight after you pay your fee, and your mountains will be gone. Mm-mm, you get rid of warts that way, but not mountains. Warts you can take off a string and pieces of old potato, but you can't do nothing with mountains. Right? What's the matter with all these promises? I don't know I ever heard of a revival meeting so called in my life that didn't begin with a sermon on prayer or at least in the early stages of that revival meeting centered on one verse of Scripture in the Old Testament that said, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and then the promises that follow, I'm going to heal them. I'm going to pour blessings out of heaven they won't be able to contain. That's the famous revival verse. Every revival begins with it, challenging God's people who are called by His name to humble themselves and pray and confess their sins and get right with God and He'll pour out blessings. There have been a million prayers prayed on that promises with no results. No results whatever. How many people do you know in the Christian world who ever came to you or you heard it expressed Let's take Matthew eighteen nineteen. It says, If two of you shall agree together as touching anything, and you ask my Father in heaven, he's going to do this thing for you. Remember that verse? I remember getting on my knees with a missionary one time. We held hands in prayer. And we meant business. And we said, Lord, we got to promise your word right here on this page. It says that two of you shall agree as touching anything on this earth, and this brother and I agree as touching this thing on this earth. And we covenant right here in prayer to pray together because we are in agreement together on this very thing. We want it for your glory. We want it for your praise. We want it for your honor. We want it for Jesus' sake, and we're agreed that we should have it. And we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and God never did it. And he didn't even answer us. And in order to save our spiritual face, we had to come up with little theological gimmicks like, well, I guess we didn't have enough faith. But that wasn't true because we both believed with all of our heart that God was going to do it. And he didn't. And then we came up with little things like, well, there must have been sin in our life and we didn't know it. And therefore God wouldn't hear us because we'd been under the lie of the religious world that if there was any iniquity in my heart God would not regard me let me tell you something my dear people my God has removed my sin as far as the east be from the west and my iniquities and my transgressions are no longer remembered against me they've been buried in the deepest part of the sea of his forgetfulness and the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ wiped them all out yesterday, today, and forever as though they never existed. God is not dealing with me about sin. He will never deal with me about sin again. He dealt with my Savior because of my sin. Sin is no question with God, not with his people. Oh, but the messages I heard about the wedge of gold buried in the tent floor. A secret sin right here in the church that keeps God's blessing from coming down. As silly and as childish, childish as though some little primary children had sit down and wrote the rules of Christianity. This concludes part one of CS 59, part one, The Mystery of Prayer. For the conclusion of this message, please follow the link to CS 59, part two, Mystery of Prayer, conclusion.